Okay, we're going to be in Mark 2 today. Mark 2. Finishing up chapter 2 of Mark, where Jesus claims himself Lord of the Sabbath. Before we begin, uh, I have a DVD here that I'd be willing to uh, lend out, see if anybody wants to watch it. So very up to date with the latest scientific uh, discoveries, uh, again proving the Bible is very scientific and uh, evolution and man-made uh, uh, distractions from the Bible to get people not to think about the Bible and God are not scientific at all. They are junk science. They are, they are deliberate lies. Here we have all the latest facts and research. Would anybody be interested in watching this? Do you need the title of the Well, but just go ahead and take it first. I have to warn you, it's kind of technical. You're not going to understand it all because there's a lot of scientific terminology in it, but I think you get the gist of it. That's right. <laughs> okay, Mark 2. And I want to uh, pick it up right at the, towards the end, the last two verses of the chapter. Verses 27 and 28, as you know, Jesus has been uh, responding to the Pharisees' accusation in verse 24 that what he and his disciples are doing is unlawful. They are breaking the Sabbath ceremonial law, or the third commandment, is the accusation. Jesus de defends it by uh, basically telling them in verse 25, you don't know the Bible well enough. And he points out uh, one example there. You're going to, to hear another example uh, in the gospel lesson uh, coming up uh, in worship service. But uh, he gives one example of report in Mark here, such that King David and the chief priest, actually, according to the Jewish man-made traditions, also violated the Sabbath. And of course, if they're going to criticize Jesus, they are going to also have to criticize King David and the high priest, which they would not do. So he puts them on the horn of the dilemma, which pretty much shuts them up and ends the argument. But then he summarizes what he's trying to say uh, in a much larger sense in verse 27 and 28. And here's his summary. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. We're going to see what that means. What is Jesus saying there? Uh, first of all, verse 27, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made. The Sabbath was made. Who made the Sabbath? How did God make the Sabbath? Okay, well, he, first of all, he created time. Uh, he created days. Sabbath day is a day. He created the week. How did he create the week? Seven-day week? On the seventh day, he rested. That's right. He created all things in six days and rested the seventh day. And he said, that's the way it's going to be for you. And so to this day, though the vast majority of the world is godless, it still follows God's plan of seven days in a week. And uh, God, as Daryl says, then said, as I rested on the seventh day, so I command you to rest on the seventh day. God created it. He made it. He made the, the whole idea of Sabbath. 
Uh, Shabbat in Hebrew meaning rest. Okay, why did he create it? The Sabbath was made. Why? Why did God make the Sabbath? Okay. Okay, that's definitely one reason. But the word itself suggests one other reason. That's right. So you're not constantly laboring for your daily bread. Putting your mind and physical efforts always into the here and to the now. Uh, how, how do I eat today? How do I have a shelter today? How do I have clothing today? How do I have the basics of life in this world today? If you did that all the time, you would never rest. But even God rested from his work. And so the first reason he made the Sabbath was so that you could rest your body from uh, uh, working to make a living. If you go back to Deuteronomy 5, this is one of the two places in the Bible where the Ten Commandments are listed in order. The other is Exodus 20, but we'll go to Deuteronomy 5 and see what God said when he created or he made the Sabbath uh, law, the Third Commandment. We'll pick it up at Deuteronomy 5.12. Deuteronomy 5.12. Your God made the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it. And we'll get back to that in a moment. Sanctify it. As the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. And that means labor for your, your occupation in life. Whether it be a secretary in an office, whether it be pulling a lever in a factory, whether it be farming, whatever your labor is, however you earn your living. Does God want us to work? Does God want us to have jobs? Oh, absolutely. Six days thou shalt labor. He wants us to labor for six days. You don't? You're lazy. You're slothful. And not only that, you're stealing from other people who are supporting you with their labor. So here he's commanding labor, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with working, having a job. Well, not only that, before they reject the garden, he said, work and tend the garden. Even in paradise, yes. there was work. <coughs> Work's not bad. In a sinful world, it makes us tired. As, as God said, you, you'll, you'll do it with the sweat of your brow. <laughs> it won't be pleasurable anymore, but you'll do it anyway. He's commanding it here. Thou shalt labor six days and do all thy work. But not all the time. Verse 14, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Nobody works on the seventh day. That thy manservant uh, and thy maidservant may what? Rest. Rest. As well as thou. That's the first reason. And that's where it gets its name, Sabbath. It means rest in Hebrew. Okay. Now, what he means there is uh, you're not going to do your regular six-day occupation. But the, but the Pharisees over the centuries, the, 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 the elders of the Jews, had expanded that that third commandment to mean much, much more than God ever intended. That you can't even uh, 
do this or this or this. You can't lift your, your hand up on the, on the Sabbath day. That's right. You could only walk so many steps or that would be labor, work. They, they, t- they defined it every bodily movement, moving any muscle. You see, God never intended that. He's talking about the labor to fulfill your uh, daily bread, your occupation, your job. Don't do your job seven days a week. You need to rest. That's number one. Your body needs to rest. Your mind needs to rest. So that was the first reason for this, that God made the Sabbath, that people would be forced to rest a day from their regular occupation. All right. But then he also said, as we pointed out, to sanctify now that brings in, make it holy. Make it, set it aside for God. Don't just lay down on a couch and do nothing. That's the day you now also feed your soul. You hear God speak to you through his word, and you speak to God in prayer and worship. And you gather together with your fellow believers to do this. You pull in them oh, all that the Bible says about that day. Uh, so, a lot of people look at the Ten Commandments and they say, oh, here's God putting his thumb down on us. Here's God punishing us. Here's God taking away our fun. Oh, those Ten Commandments, boy, they're really bad. Just the opposite. The Ten Commandments are for our good. He commanded us these things for our good, for our happiness, for our blessing, including the Third Commandment. We have spiritual needs. We have physical needs. We need to have fun. We need to have enjoyment. We need to have rest and recreation. We need to lay down our labor at times and just do something different for our physical and mental well-being. He commanded this for our good. Or I said, some of you people, you're just going to work yourself into the ground. You know, this is, this, this, is, this is the thing that a lot of people are missing. God loves you. It's not just some phrase on a bumper sticker. What that means is he wants you to be happy. His happiness is his goal. I mean, your happiness is his goal. He wants you, he created you for joy. He created you to be um, glad. Not sad. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were perfectly happy. The sadness came with sin, disobeying God, not obeying Him. If we were to obey God's commandments, we'd be happy. And and here the third commandment, he, He gives this to us for our enjoyment. So you're not working all the time at your occupation so that you're resting and having fun on at least one day a week. That's good. God likes that. He, he wants you to do that. But not only that, you have spiritual needs. You need God. You need to trust in him. You need to have faith in him as your savior. That's good for you. It's too bad God has to command us to do it. Command us to do what's good for us and will make us happy. But he does. The commandments are for our enjoyment and for our happiness. So, getting back to what Jesus says in Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man. That's what he means. For man's good for man's happiness, for man's enjoyment, to fulfill man's needs. Which was made first, man or the Sabbath? Man. And then God created the Sabbath for man. 
to fulfill some of man's needs that would give him joy and happiness. That's what Jesus means here. The Sabbath was made for man, for man's good, for man's pleasure, so man would have a good life. But is this the way the Pharisees looked at it? They had turned it with all of these man-made rules, which you could do and couldn't do on the Sabbath, they turned it into a what? A burden, burden. exactly. Oh, it's a Sabbath, now let's get the book out. What can't we do? What do we have to do? It was just a terrible drudge, is what they turned it into. God never intended it for that. God intended it for man's enjoyment. The Pharisees are turning it into a hammer to hammer people with. Hammer them down. As Daryl said, burdens. How many burdens had they put on man because of the Sabbath? They had taken the third commandment and they had divided it into six subcommandments, six subclasses, and under each subclass they had put 39 different kinds of work that you could not do. Six times 39. Yeah, yeah, and the, this is something God never intended. He simply said, don't do your job on, on uh, the Sabbath day, the seventh day. That's all. But sanctify it to the Lord. Get together with your fellow believers around my word of life for your souls so that you will have faith and eternal life and happiness also in this world. So they had come up with all these regulations, all these restrictions that they had burdened people with, as Daryl says. And, and, and they had tried to enforce it like the law, like, like, like the police. They had pinned people down so much they didn't enjoy the Sabbath anymore. What was the result if you violated that? What was the punishment to the people? Well, it's like they were threatening Jesus here with. If you couldn't need you to do that, you'd be excommunicated. You'd get thrown out of Israel. Okay. Do you see any parallels with that today? Is this still this kind of taking away people's fun that God intends them to have, their enjoyment, their pleasure, being taught by churches? I I think people think that. um, They look at getting up in the morning to go to church as a burden, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's their simple thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, We say other churches. I know other churches try to do more, less preaching God's word and more social activity. Um, Okay. But you're you're talking about the opposite of what I'm looking for. The Pharisees didn't say, hey, let's have a social instead of staying home and doing nothing. They did the opposite. They said, you can't have a social. You can't uh, have any fun or pleasure. Uh, I don't know if I... Maybe the churches out there that say that. How about drinking? Any church that says drinking alcohol is bad? Yeah, if it's a, if it's a sin to drink alcohol, period. Uh-huh. Not being drunk. If somebody this, the whole women's temperance movement came from that. The whole, you know, thing back in the 30s in the United States, uh, prohibition, that all came from the women's temperance movement, which came from churches. They, they looked at alcohol as being sinful. Uh, alcohol itself was a sin. That's right, and why not? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So alcohol, they're saying, is sinful. Drinking alcohol is sinful. Did God say that in the Bible? Yeah, he he turned water into wine. His first miracle, Jesus. God created alcohol just like he created the Sabbath. Well, he condemns drunkenness. You can misuse any of God's good gifts. In in man's sinful heart, he can find a way to misuse any of the gifts. Noah didn't drink. 
That's right, and it was wrong. It was a sin. And that was wrong. He, he belittled his father because of it. Did not respect and honor his father. Yeah, the Bible condemns any misuse of God's gifts, whether it be sex or a car. Anything that's good that God has allowed man to have, man, in his sinfulness, has misused it. But that doesn't make the thing itself bad. Uh, The Bible actually commends alcohol. It says it makes glad the heart of men. God wants us to be glad. (laughs) He doesn't want us to be moping around all the time. And he gives us, he says, this will help. This will help. This is a gift to you. Now, don't get drunk. Don't lose your sense. The New Testament says, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. And Jesus did use wine at the Lord's Supper. And the only reason these churches use grape juice is because of this man-made tradition, man-made law that God never put upon us, that alcohol is sinful. That's one example how churches come up with laws that take away man's enjoyment that God never did. Uh, How about uh, dancing? Any churches that say dancing is evil? Oh, there have been. Mm-hmm. Well, I have. Uh, people are even surprised that I, a pastor, go to dancing. I go to ballroom dancing. Oh, oh you're a pastor and you dance. Really? Like, we're not supposed to have any fun. So they don't offend people, yeah. yeah. Can you <coughs> turn dancing into something that's sinful? Yes you, can. yes, you can, just like alcohol. You can misuse the gift. We were crying out loud, David danced, King David. Uh, they danced after the crossing of the Red Sea in the book of Exodus. Dancing is another thing God's given us for our enjoyment. But some churches say, you got to take it away. Why? Because some people misuse it. Turn it into a lustful thing. That doesn't make it wrong just because some people misuse it. You can take away everything. That's right. Yeah, you could you could make up man-made rules to pretty much take away everything. And I think a lot of people think that's what churches do. Well, in some cases they're right. Uh, how about uh, playing cards? That's right. If you turn it into gambling, that is a sin of stealing. But just playing a game is a sin? No. If it's fun, do it. But don't sin. You can play games without sinning. Some churches say you can't have a blood transfusion. Jehovah's Witnesses. Bible ever say that? Well, they think it does, but it doesn't. What if it could save a life? They, they wouldn't do it. That's like the Pharisees. I don't care if you die. You can't do that. Even though God never forbade it. Very easy to get what we call legalistic in religion. Make up man-made regulations and restrictions that God never put upon us. Well, that's what the Pharisees did. But what that defies is this truth that God gave us his law for our good. Not to take away our good, but to give us good. The law is good, the Bible says. 
The law of God is good. It doesn't take away our joy. It gives us joy if we follow it. What takes away our joy is when we break God's law. Now we're talking God's law here, not man's legalistic restrictions. God is love. He wants you to be happy. He wouldn't give you laws to make you unhappy. It's, it, it's good for you. It makes you happy if you come to church. It's good for your whole life. It makes your whole life better when you go to church. Especially if you go to a church where the Bible is preached and taught in its full truth and purity. It gives you a happier life. That's good. God only wants your good. Everything he gives you is good, whether it's his law or the gospel. So, Jesus begins, verse 27, the summation of his lesson, the Sabbath was made for man. And you could add, for man's good. Sabbath serves man. Sabbath helps man. Sabbath laws what God intended is good for man. That's what Jesus is saying there. But then he goes on to say, and not man for the Sabbath. Who taught that? That's what the Pharisees were teaching. Yeah, like, well, the Sabbath came first, and then God created man for the good of the Sabbath, to serve the Sabbath. The Pharisees treated man as if man had been created for the purpose of keeping their Sabbath laws. That's why man was created. So that you would follow these 39 times 6 restrictions. And they had to be kept. You have to keep them. They fence you in because the Sabbath was created first, and then you were created for the Sabbath. So, no, if it hurts you, tough. If it takes away your enjoyment, tough. The Sabbath comes first. The Sabbath is supreme. Man is under the Sabbath. That's, that was their view. Even if it hurts man, no matter what it does to man, doesn't matter because man was made for the Sabbath. God cares more for the right spiritual condition of the heart than for the outward observations, outward observance of his own ceremonial regulations is what Jesus is getting at here. Yeah, Jesus had quoted up above an Old Testament ceremonial law. Not a Sabbath law, an Old Testament ceremonial law where Uh, there would be bread on the altar in the temple and only the priest could eat it. It wasn't just meant for everybody. This was just for the priest. This was their their due, their wages. Okay, This was like offerings that you bring to to the Lord today and then you pay your pastor a a wage for his labor. No, this was their wage. This was was for the priest. Okay, So they had the bread on the altar for the priest. This is the ceremonial law, as we looked at it earlier. Uh, But along comes David, the future king, and his men, and they're starving. They haven't eaten for a few days. And they they go to the temple. They go to the high priest. It's actually a tabernacle at that point, a tent. And, And they go to the high priest, and they say, man, can you give us some food? We're, we're really hungry. And the high priest says, well, the priest says, well, we don't have any food except the priest's food. We got a lot of that, but the law of God, the ceremonial law, says only the priest can eat and you're not priests. But he goes to the high priest and says, these guys are dying. Couldn't we take some of this bread off the altar and so these guys don't die? And the high priest says, sure, 
Because there's a higher law. What is the higher law? Love. You see somebody in desperate need of food, you don't walk by on the other side because of some ceremony, law, an observance. No matter how it affects man, as if that law was made first and man serves the law? No. There's a higher law than the ceremonial law of the showbread. It's the law of love. And the high priest knew this. And so he allowed the priest to give the bread off the altar to David and his men. That's the example of Jesus. What is he teaching here? He's teaching, yeah, the laws are good. But just the outward observance of them is not what God is looking at. He's looking at your heart. And the heart should say, I love people and I love God. That's the overriding law. The Bible says love is the fulfilling of the law. Now here, Jesus and his men are walking through the field. Nothing wrong with that. Old Testament law permitted that. That you could glean from the field. You just couldn't go in and harvest another man's field. But whatever you could eat as you're walking through the field was okay. So they were doing that. But they had to pluck the ears off and, and shell the corn to eat it. That's where the Pharisees said, oh, well, that's against the regulation. That's regulation number 142. So you have to starve to death to serve the Sabbath. And Jesus says, that's not the law of God. You're breaking the, the most basic law of God, which is love your neighbor. When he's in need and you can help him, you help him. That's the overriding law, which the Pharisees just totally missed. So something trumped that ceremonial law of the showbread. And what was it that trumped that law in God's eyes? Yeah, yeah. And what was the need that trumped the law? David's hunger. David's hunger. David's hunger trumped even a divine regulation. Because the Sabbath was not uh, or the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so Jesus is saying, if that's the case with David, does not the hunger of my disciples trump your man-made laws? Not even God's laws out of the Bible. Love trumped even a God's law of the showbread. Should it not trump your man-made Talmud laws? This leads to a bigger lesson. The Sabbath was made for man. Not only was the Sabbath made for man, the whole universe was made for man. It wasn't made for God. God didn't need the universe. Was it made for the angels? Everything in the universe, the whole universe was made for who? It was made for man, us, Adam and Eve and their children. That's why God made all this, for us. So you can plug in where Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. You can put, it, put in the universe was made for man. The last thing God made was man and made in his image. The only thing made in his image. He made it all for us. The sun is there for us. The stars are there for us. The galaxies are there for us. The cells of our body made for us. Alcohol made for us. Trees made for us. Grass made for us. You name it, it was all made for us. So that we would be what? Happy. That's what, that's what God's all about. That's what it means when it says God is love. Love for man. 
for man's enjoyment, for man's pleasure. It is God's will that man does enjoy it. You shouldn't feel guilty when you enjoy God's creation in any way, whether you're eating or drinking or playing cards or dancing or contemplating nature in a rowboat, whatever. This is why God made us. He wants us to be happy. He, how much does he want us to be happy? Not only did he create the whole universe for us, he did something even more than that. Yeah. He says, well, you've sinned, you've, you've, you've you messed it all up, but I still love you. I still want you to be happy. I'll even go down, take all that sin upon myself, and pay my justice price for you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he wants you to be happy. And he'll give you that happiness, not only in this life, by working all things for your good as a Christian, but he'll give you eternal life in heaven. Eternal happiness. Perfect happiness. God wants you to be happy. The word blessed, you see the word blessed all the time in the Bible. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament. Psalms, Proverbs, Beatitudes, you name it. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. You know what word blessed means? It means happy. God wants you to be happy. Keep that always in mind. You have a God who... Want you to be happy. Want you to enjoy what he's created for you. If you're not happy, then something's wrong. It is God's will, Jesus said, to give you the kingdom. It's God's good, it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom makes God happy. When you're happy, it makes God happy. God didn't make the world and put man in it to serve the world. He made the world first and be ready for man. God did not choose people for the place. God chose the place for the people, for us, for man, not for the animals. Animals were made for our enjoyment. Uh, everything, everything you've ever experienced, God made for you to enjoy. But man wants to restrict you. Man wants to take these things away from you, take away your enjoyment. Certainly the devil wants to. So this is what Jesus means in verse 27 when he says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Which is how the Pharisees had turned it upside down. And then verse 28, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. I want you to just look at three words first in that verse that kind of sum it all up. Man is Lord. <laughs> you see that? Just, just juxtapose those three words. What is Jesus saying? That man uh, is over the Sabbath. No, that's, that's a, after what I just said, that's a good conclusion, but that's not what he's saying. He's not saying man is Lord, he's saying, yeah, the Son of Man is Lord. <laughs> Why does he call himself Son of Man? Yeah, he has to be, God had to become a true man to save us, to make us happy. He had to become a man. He had to become a son of man. And he doesn't say a son of man, the son of man, one particular son of man, the promised one from the Garden of Eden, the son, <coughs> the seed of the woman. <coughs> now, we pointed out back earlier uh, in this chapter, in verse 10, where Jesus uses that phrase, the Son of Man, 
to describe himself. That's always how he's referring to himself. Uh, it probably, as we pointed out in verse, as we studied verse 10, comes from Daniel, the book of Daniel, where Daniel sees this vision and he sees the Son of God. He says, but he looks like the Son of Man. So it, it's a biblical phrase that Jesus uses here to refer to himself quite often in all four Gospels. In fact, we learned back then that I think it occurs 79 times in the four Gospels, average of about 20 in each Gospel. So it's a very common phrase that Jesus uses, but it's to say, I'm the representative man. I'm the son of man. I'm what mankind has produced. Because I wouldn't have to come down and become a man if man hadn't sinned. So I'm the representative man. I am the man that will take all the sin of man on myself. But I have to be a man. So Jesus is true man. Not a fake man, doesn't just look like a man, like he did in the Old Testament, you know, the angel of the Lord we saw in Genesis. He's a true man, truly conceived in the virgin and born as man. But he is also what, he says here in verse 28, which is what? God. God. Right there in that one verse, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and to the world, I am the God-man. I am the Lord that made the Sabbath. In verse 27, the Sabbath was made. Who made it? God. I am that God, but I'm also the Son of Man. I am man and God. Uh, You know, you go out and you ask people, in your understanding, who is Jesus Christ? A lot of times people say, oh, he's the son of God, because they've heard that so often. But they don't mean God. They mean, well, you got God here, and then he had a baby. And he's not God, but he's pretty close to God, because he's God's son. Well, in that regard, the Bible calls every Christian, every believer in the Bible, a child of God. And they kind of put Jesus in the same category as any believer. Well, he's just a great believer. No, no. The Son of God. By the way, you go back to the very first uh, uh, verse of Mark. Remember when we studied that? What does it say? Yeah. So he's not only the Son of Man, he's the Son of God. But the best translation of that is of God the Son. Of God, he's the Son part. Then you got the Father and you got the Holy Ghost, but He's the Son of God. Now, I shouldn't use the word part because He's fully God. He's not just a third of God. But that's really what that's saying of God the Son. So here Jesus puts that all together in a very short sentence in verse 28. The Son of Man is Lord. I am God. The one who you're accusing of being unlawful, I am God. I make the laws, not you. I'm the God who makes the Sabbath laws and all the other commandments in the, in the Word of God. Okay, so most people think of Jesus as just a great man, a, a great historical figure. Uh, who, whose reputation has lived down to today, and a lot of people uh, admire and, and hold up. But he's infinitely more than that. He is their creator. He is the creator of all things. We say that in the Apostles' Nicene Creeds. Of course, the Athanasian Creed, too. You know those three creeds were written to to counteract the falsehood that was spreading in the Christian uh, visible church back then, that Jesus wasn't God. So they wrote the apostles, the Nicene Athanasian Creeds, to counteract that uh, Arianism. It came about from a monk, a priest named Arius, who denied Jesus was true God. So we have, have those creeds to this day. 
to set that straight. He's infinitely more than a great man. He is also, as he says here, Lord. He is Lord. And that means God. He's Jehovah, whatever you want to say. Uh, God the Son. He's the Messiah. He goes by lots of different names. So here again, Jesus is saying, who you're talking to, me, my, my miracles should have shown you this, but you're so stubborn. You're so hard-hearted. You see me raise the dead. You see me heal lepers. And it doesn't affect you. You don't see who I am. Here he's telling them point blank, the Pharisees, because he loves them too. He wants them to be happy. But that can only come by trusting and believing in him, not rejecting him. He is God. He is God incarnate, meaning become also a man. From that word carnal or flesh, incarnate, God incarnate. Uh, God also become a true man, a miracle of miracles, uh, that God could become a, a, a creature. The creator becomes also a creature. How can that happen? That's beyond our understanding. Uh, he was doing this same thing earlier in the chapter, back in what I referred to before, beginning in verse 7. Uh, where the Pharisees say, why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Remember? He said to the man that was lowered down through the roof, thy sins be forgiven thee. And they, oh, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And so Jesus says, all right, I'm going to prove to you I am God. And that I can forgive sins. This, this is the big problem with the Pharisees. They don't realize who Jesus is. They're trying to kill him. And he's God. They're trying to kill God. And they think they're the holiest people on earth. The most godly. So, uh, Jesus immediately perceived, back in verse 8, perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves. Because he's God, he can read our thoughts. He knows our thoughts. He knows them before we even think them. He said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say the sick, to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to arise, take up thy bed, and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. In other words, that I am God. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. And he did. That should have proved it right there. Jesus is patiently trying to teach these Pharisees. He is the incarnate God. But they keep stubbornly missing the point and calling what Jesus taught blasphemy against God. So we're out of time. Let's pick it up there next time. Shall we close with the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.